Good morning. I'm delighted to welcome you into God's house on this dreary and ugly Lord's Day, but it's a day made more special by your presence here. We are getting closer to spring, as you can tell by the, the daffodils that are blooming, and it won't be that long. We were just talking about how uh, daylight savings time is just two weeks away, so something to, to hold on to and to keep us coming. Of course, we have Lent coming up, and that begins in earnest on Wednesday. And we are invited to come and join us at 6 o'clock Wednesday evening for pancakes with all the trimmings. Following that, we'll have an Ash Wednesday service at 7 o'clock here at the church. So I hope to have you uh, join us for be a part of that. That is always, I think, a very meaningful way to begin our Lenten journey. Also want to remind our session of our meeting. This is scheduled for tomorrow night at 6 o'clock here at the church. And so... The last Monday rolls around once again, and we're ready to uh, jump right in. You might notice an absence today. My wife took advantage of a last-minute invitation to go to the beach, so she is celebrating a birthday with a friend down there on her way back home this afternoon, and she sends all of her love. Now, as we prepare our minds and our hearts for worship, let's make sure to focus on the one true living God.
Would you pray with me? Source of light, God of great mercy and love, we come to you this day seeking restoration of our sight. Clear away our blindness and give us a new vision of all that we can accomplish in your name. Give us strength and confidence to truly witness to your abiding love and faithfulness. For we offer this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. We are blind to many things. The light of God shines for us today. Come, worship God who forgives and heals your blindness. For our scripture reading, we begin with the 27th Psalm. There we read, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked advance against me to devour me, it is my enemies and my foes who will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all of the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. Then to the Gospel of John, we read in the ninth chapter, a very lengthy Selection today. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. 
After saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, Isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, no, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes opened, they asked, he replied. The man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash, so I went and washed, and then I could see. Where is this man, they asked him. I don't know, he said. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. Now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Therefore the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, how can a sinner perform such signs? So they were divided. Then they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It is your eyes he opened. The man replied, he is a prophet. They still did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son, they asked? Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it that now he can see? We know he is our son, the parents answered, and we know he was born blind. But how he can see now or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who had already decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. That was why his parents said, he is of age, ask him. A second time, they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God by telling the truth, they said. We know this man is a sinner. He replied, whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. Then they asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered, I have told you already, and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Then they hurled insults at him and said, You are this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. The man answered, Now, that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly person who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man was not from God, he could do nothing. To this they replied, you were steeped in sin at birth, how dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. Jesus heard that he had been thrown out, and when he found him, he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, you have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. Jesus said, for judgment I have come into this world so that the blind will see, and those who see will become blind. Some Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and asked, what? Are we blind too? Jesus said, if you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. The word of God for the people of God.
Today's scripture offers us a few challenges. The first challenge is is that this is Transformation Sunday. It is the day that we, around the world, Christians celebrate the transformation of Jesus Christ. It's an important time because up until this point, the disciples might have had an inkling of who he was. But once they saw him transform on that mountaintop, they knew. It was a defining moment in both the lives of the disciples and the church. The problem is, John's gospel doesn't have an account of the transformation. I don't know if he thought it not worthy or if he thought it was covered fine by the other gospel writers, but he chose not to write about it, so there's nothing in the gospel of John to talk about. So, one year out of every four, we can kind of gloss over it, or we can skip this Sunday in the lectionary and find a scripture that talks about the transformation, or we can perhaps find a way to see the transformation through another source. The second challenge is, is that we've already seen, it is a very lengthy passage. My favorite way to go through a scripture is verse by verse. If we did that, we would be here until dark today. So I will be glossing over some of it, but hopefully we'll cover all the important parts. The third challenge is found in the the story itself. Many times people read this and suggest that This person must have been born blind because either he or his parents sinned, and obviously sinned grievously. That was the prevailing wisdom in that day, and there are still people who believe that today. The man was born that way, at least the scriptures say that, perhaps. So it can't be his own sin that doomed him, it must have been his But then, haven't all of our parents sinned as well? Why were we not born blind? Everyone sins, yet not all are born with disabilities. I think it further suggests that God would be mean-spirited if he used a child to show his disdain with the parents. When you read the original text, there are no punctuation marks, there are no verse numbering. You have to use context clues and examine other forms of literature and use some plain old-fashioned logic at times to find out how the story is supposed to unfold. The ones who did the original translations have given it to us in this form, but how can we know if they are right. Today's passage is a good example. We read in the opening verse, as he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. The problem is is that in the original language, it does not say that. There's a tiny Greek word, hina, H-I-N-A, which in essence means so that. If this, then this, so that this. We've seen it borne out in our own lives. If I'm going to be reasonable to deal with, I'm going to have a cup of coffee before I begin the day. If I'm going to be productive tomorrow, I'm going to have to get a good night's sleep tonight. He did something so that something else. The translators have made the assumption that the the before was that he was born blind so that Christ can use him in his miracle. Now, I'm perfectly aware and willing to concede that God was capable of seeing into the future, knowing that Jesus was going to be at that point in his ministry and would need some way to express himself. He could have indeed had this man born blind just for that purpose. But I don't think so. 
He would make a child and then a young adult and then a grown man live through a life of misery just to prove a point. It just does not make any sense to me. How about if we put that innocent word henna in another context? One that doesn't turn God into an evil puppet master. And a professor of Bible and religion and philosophy by the name of Joanne Brandt does just that. Her specialty is the book of John. Here is the way she translates the verse. Neither did this one nor his parents sin, but in order that the works of God might be manifest to you, it is necessary for us to work the works of the one who has sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one is able to work. In essence, her contention is that Jesus is saying the only cause and effect at work here is that we must work so that God's work is done here on earth. That means it is for you and for me, for all of us. That is why we are born. That is why. We are born this way. Our song of worship this morning is hymn number 491. Open our eyes. I invite you to stand as we sing. Please pray with me. Dear and precious Lord, we come to you asking for forgiveness and bowing in your presence. We thank you for the gift of your Son and the love you have shown us through faith, grace, and the Holy Spirit. We are so grateful we can come to you in prayer and you will hear every one. Forgive us for our sinfulness and help us to listen for your word. Bring us close to you and transform us as you did Jesus on the mountain. Help us transform our lives into Christ-like people and bring others into the light of your word. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Forgive us as we come to you in prayer for those who are ill and need of lo your loving care. We know you hear every prayer so we pray for those here at Shiloh and with connections to Shiloh and those we name out Lord, out loud, and in our hearts. We thank you for the healing of Let Linda Angel and for the continuing improvement of Barbara, Marguerite, and Billy Howell. We pray for those ill with the virus and for the caregivers and staff at the hospital caring for them. We pray for the first responders as well, for their steadfastness. We pray for all who are homebound and infirm. Help us to bring your word to them in our broadcasts and calls. For all those who are victims of natural disaster, war, violence, and crime. We know we fall short of your purpose for us to help, so help us to see those in need and 
Help them as you would them and provide for them. We pray for our teachers and our children in school. Keep them safe without fear of illness. Lord, in your mercy, help us strengthen and support one another and show that we trust in the God of the universe and his Son, our Lord. We pray for the oppressed and victims of terrorism and tyranny. We come to you with heavy hearts because of the tyranny forced upon the people of Ukraine. We pray for them as they seek safety and ask that you lead them out of harm's way. Help us continue to work toward peace. We pray for the other nations that are threatened by this act of aggression and pray that they remain vigilant and ready to repel any attack. We pray for our men and women in the military who are on alert and ask that you keep them safe and prepared to help in whatever call they receive. We pray for our leaders to tread carefully but proclaim the injustice of this act of tyranny. Keep us in your care and come into our hearts and transfigure our lives and minds for service to you. In Jesus' name we pray, as he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You may be seated. So, what has just happened? Jesus has performed a miracle. In the Synoptic Gospels, that's how it's phrased, they all wrote about the miracles that he performed, but John instead uses the word signs. It's a subtle but an important distinction. John's purpose seems to be to establish who Jesus is, his role in the kingdom, and our response to it. A miracle then points at the recipient. He was blind, but now he sees. It is a miracle. A sign points at the one who performs the miracle. He was blind, but Jesus gave him sight. No matter what you call it, it is something remarkable. And how did the temple leaders respond? They suggested that Jesus was probably evil. It would be impossible for him to be from God. They had already made their minds up what the Messiah would look like, and Jesus did not fit that mold. 
How many times have we done similar things than that? But I would never miss Jesus, you say. The story is told of a young boy who was preparing his letter to Santa Claus. And he began writing, Dear Santa, I have been good this year. And he paused and tore it up and threw it away and started over. Dear Santa, I have tried to be... He paused again and tore it up and threw it away. Dear Santa, I have worked hard... Once again, he tore it up, threw it away. He walked over to the Christmas tree, found the manger scene, and then took the little baby Jesus and put it in his pocket. Then he went back and finished his letter. Dear Santa, if you ever want to see the boy again. Now, I I heard a story about a family who had set up their manger scene at home and the baby Jesus was gone. I'm not sure if that's what happened with theirs, but in any event, they were in a bind. And so they found something that they thought would be suitable and replaced the baby Jesus as a temporary measure. But you know how those temporary measures go. Christmas came and went. They put it away, and the following year when they took it out, the baby Jesus was still gone. And they kept trying new things, but nothing ever worked quite like that original baby Jesus. And there's a deep theological truth to be found there. You can try a lot of different things, but nothing, and I say nothing, is ever going to work quite like Jesus does. I think we know what the religious leader's problem was or doing. Was it his methodology? I mean, who puts mud on someone's eye? Was it his lack of pedigree? He's from Galilee. Nothing good comes from Galilee. Was it that ragtag group of disciples who followed him around who had no theological training at all? I suspect that the real problem was none of these. Now, I think what was happening here is they were envious. They were used to being the center of attention. And now comes this man, Jesus, stealing their attention. There comes a time in the life of each one of us when we need to push self aside and depend exclusively on God. I would suggest to you that when the Son of God shows up, would be one of those times. And this would be an appropriate time to remind you where we are. We are in the house of God. And to remind you when it is. This is a special day. A day that we have set aside to worship that God. And it is a special hour because it is the one that draws all of our attention away from everything else and focuses it on God. So with that in mind, I think it's fairly comfortable to say that we know that God is in our midst right now. So now's a good time to stop running and stop trying to run the show and allow God to do what he would have us do. And when that happens, and only when that happens, then this church is going to be the church that God intends it to be. Psychologists have come up with the term cognitive dissonance. It's simply a way of saying someone has compelling evidence to overturn a long-held belief, but simply are not willing to. The temple leaders were experiencing cognitive dissonance. They had lived their lives in the hopes of seeing the promised one come. And now as evidence begins to mount that that promised one was indeed here, they found ways to ignore it. We are not immune to cognitive dissonance. 
I know you probably get tired of hearing about my dieting, but it is a major, major portion of my life these days. And one of the biggest obstacles that I face in my path to losing weight is ice cream. I have cognitive dissonance that I know it is destructive to my diet, yet I continue to buy it and I continue to eat it. And not just eat it on occasion, but almost every night. Despite the evidence I have, I ignore it because the greater good is eating ice cream. Maybe, not all of them, but I suspect that some of them had an inkling that this Jesus was the real thing, even though he didn't check all of their preconceived boxes. So naturally, I want to poke fun at them then I remember the ice cream. Your faith in God is not measured in degrees. You either have faith or you don't have faith. Now, it's not to say that on occasion you're going to let a little bit of doubt slip in, but when your doubt is your default setting, it's time to stake stock in what's going on in your life. The Jewish establishment refused to accept that this renegade pseudo-prophet had showed up out of nowhere and was capable of doing God's work. Why? Because he didn't meet their standards. It's easy for us to sit here 2,000 years removed from it and making fun of them and their lack of understanding, but 2,000 years later, we're still doing the same thing. I cannot tell you the number of times I have, just using Facebook as one example, I have read that it is impossible to be both a Christian and a Democrat, or be a Christian and a Republican. I have read that it's impossible to be a Christian and be a member of the LGBTQ community. I've also read that it's impossible to be a Christian and be a transphobe. You can supply your own list of opposites. You've seen it. None of us are in a position to make a judgment, yet we continue to do it every day of our life. There are some lifestyle choices that, in my mind, don't g-haul with Christian faith. And so, I choose to not subscribe to any of those lifestyle choices. But I can still pray for them. I can show them a better way. I can love them. But most of all, I can demonstrate tolerance. Tolerance is not a new thing. Way back in 1689, John Locke wrote this on tolerance. If any man err from the right way, it is his own misfortune, no injury to thee. Nor therefore art thou to punish him in the things of this life, because thou supposest he will be miserable in that which is to come. Nobody, therefore, in fine, neither single persons nor churches, nay, nor even commonwealths have any just title to invade the civil rights and worldly goods of each other upon preference of religion. Reading this story, to me, it's fascinating to follow the progression that happens in this man's life. They said it wasn't him at all, just somebody that looked like him. That's cognitive dissonance at work. But he himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes opened, they asked. He replied, the man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash, so I went and I washed, and then I could see. 
Where is this man, they asked him. I don't know, he said. It was a man. They called him Jesus. The way he phrased that suggests to me that this man didn't call him anything. He didn't know who it was. He had to have been filled with gratitude. Who wouldn't be? But this was just another man in his newly sighted eyes. So once again, the man is summoned and questioned by the Pharisees. Then they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. The man replied, he is a prophet. The man's vision was not the only thing that has improved. He began to see other things more clearly. He was not just a man. He was a prophet. And so they began to look for ways to discredit him. They brought in his parents and questioned them, but they were not willing to stick their neck out, even for their son. So once again, the Pharisees brought the man back in. A second time, they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God by telling the truth, they said. We know this man is a sinner. He replied, Whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. Then they ask him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered, I have told you already, and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Don't you know that went over well with the Pharisees? They were busy looking for ways to discredit Jesus, not to align themselves with him. The blind man was just not cooperating with them at all. And so they did the next logical step in the process. They discarded decorum and began hurling insults at him. It's still a favorite technique of today. When it's clear you're losing an argument, you start calling them names. You are this fellow's disciples. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. And that left the door wide open for this man's rebuttal. The man answered, now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly person who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. Debating didn't work. Calling him names didn't work. So they put into effect the third leg of their plan to discredit him. They kicked him out. Kicked him out for not understanding them or their ways. I would like to introduce you to Natalie Bowles Weber. You would not guess by looking at her that she is a Lutheran minister. When you hear her talk, you would not imagine her to be a Lutheran minister. When you hear her theology, you probably would not guess that she is a Lutheran minister. It might shake your foundation and what you believe if you listen to her. And I hope you would. And I hope you do. And I hope it does shake your foundation. Even if you don't change the way you think, change the way you believe, just listening to her words, reading her words, accepting the possibility that there is a grain of truth in what she has to say can go a long way toward improving yourself. You see, nothing shuts down your growth faster than concluding that you already know everything. And take it to the next step. If you already know it, then you're right. As 
No point in listening to someone else. Jesus sought this man out. Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, you have seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. The transition is now complete. Jesus has gone from being a man to a prophet to from God to someone to worship. And it is my prayer that this happens to you Nothing more repulsive than the one who will not see. Knowing what to do, but just won't try. Goes away, but still gets lost. Goes rules, but still gets tossed. Had enough, but can't be satisfied. Yet sometimes I
with me? Here in God, we have languished in our blindness. We have chosen to hide in darkness in order to avoid reaching out and risking your acceptance. We are afraid of the light, and yet we crave it. In your light, there is healing and hope, restoration and transformation. Forgive our lack of faith and our fearfulness, O oh Lord. Give us courage to reach out to the light and accept its healing rays. May our lives be transformed by your mercy. And for and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Even though you have lived in darkness, God's light is being poured out for you. Accept the light, a love that is freely offered, and be transformed by its healing mercies. Amen. Now I invite you to remember this, life is short. We have not long to gladden the hearts of those with whom we journey. Therefore, be swift to love, make haste to be kind, and live your lives in the light of change. Go in peace.